very good evening to all of you so it's my privilege and a pleasure to be back in this great learning platform cybersight so this time we'll be speaking about a topic that is very relevant in today's scenario which has gained more importance in the covid situation where we are seeing more and more number of dry eyes so in this webinar i'll try to cover it in a simple way that in every section i'll try to make it relevant to a private practitioner who can just diagnose and treat it with whatever simple equipment that is available in a clinic and also touch upon the recent advances in this field so that you know what is going on and uh, this is an evolving field i think in the coming few years dry eye is going to be a subspecialty in itself and all of us must uh, gear up to get to it so i am dr madhu and i am from srikaran institute of ophthalmology india i have no financial disclosures in the talk that i or any of the products that i am going to mention in the presentation so the scope of this talk would start with a pre test to test the existing knowledge you have on the field then i'll briefly touch upon the definition and classification we'll see the pathophysiology and i'll simplify the whole dry eye into six simple tasks for you so that you can easily diagnose and manage this condition finally i'll touch upon on a deeper way in meibomian gland disease as most of the participants have asked me to stress upon this disease more which is part of this dry eye disease and finally we'll end it with a post test and answer a few questions that the registered delegates have already put in before we go in for the live delegates so these are the pre test questions i have for you so the first question is which one of the following is included in the definition of dry eye as per tifos du 2 it is a multifactorial disease the patient should have symptoms hyperosmolarity is part of this definition or all of the above thank you i'll go to the next question which one of the following does not cause evaporative kind of dry eye a meibomian gland disease b lacrimal gland dysfunction c improper blinking d contact lens intolerance and your time starts now thank you the third question is ocular surface staining can be assessed by which of the following a corneal staining b lid margin staining c conjunctival staining d all of the above and your time starts now thank you for the response which is not a modifiable risk factor in dry eye which is not a modifiable risk factor a contact lens wear b meibomian gland dysfunction c computer usage d medications this could be ocular or systemic and your time starts now thank you now we'll go to the final question identify the diagnostic test that is being performed in this picture a mmp9 detecting device osmolarity detecting device from tear lab or lipid layer thickness detecting device both a and c thank you so that finishes my quiz now the answers the same five questions we'll discuss after we finish our topic so that you can gain knowledge out of the coming few slides that i share with you so coming to the definition let us dissect the definition of dry eye into three steps the first thing is dry eye is a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface two 
it is characterized both by an unstable tear film and the patient should have some form of ocular symptoms and finally it can be caused by any of these hyperosmolarity ocular surface inflammation or damage and neurosensory abnormalities so it's basically a multifactorial disease that can be caused by any of these hyperosmolarity ocular surface disease or neurosensory abnormalities and it has to have both signs and symptoms that is the reason you need to document an unstable tear film and also see that the patient has symptoms only then it fits into the definition of a dry eye so when you classify dry eye it is etiologically based so if you see in this picture this is the lacrimal gland and these are the meibomian glands so basically the aqueous deficient dry eye it is a deficit in the lacrimal gland function the tears itself are not produced are produced in a scanty way that leads to this condition called as aqueous deficient dry eye disease whereas in evaporative dry eye disease which constitutes to 80% of the cases that we see in our opd uh, the problem is not with the lacrimal gland but these are related to the meibomian glands that you can appreciate in the lids that are there in the both upper and lower lids here so the problem with evaporative gland is it, the problem is mostly related to meibomian glands or blink related problems where the ocular surface is disturbed so this is a very busy slide where you can see the pathophysiology of dry eye so to the left side you can see all the lacrimal gland related activity that is taking place and that causes this aqueous deficient dry eye so in the outer circle here so these are the things that can cause aqueous deficient dry eye that can be aging lower androgens autoimmune diseases lacrimal obstruction systemic drugs or it can be a reflex block because of a surgery contact lens wear or anesthesia whereas towards your right you whatever you see in the outer circle is related to the meibomian gland disease where the cause could be anterior blepharitis there is an unstable tear film or a lipid layer vitamin deficiency ocular allergy preservatives that we use in drops and all these things come into the evaporative phase and the left side is the low flow you just cannot separate these two things and look at them in a separate way in a way at the center they intermingle with each other and they cause this vicious cycle of one causing the effect on other and in that way you cannot purely differentiate between these two conditions but in a way it is a combination of both these things so look at this slide very carefully this slide will be the entire presentation that i'm going to speak about for your convenience this is the slide that is taken from the tifos due to recommendation so if you see carefully here i have divided this slide into six part the first part is the triaging question the second part is the risk factor analysis the third part is the symptomology the fourth part is the test that we see for looking at the homeostasis of the tear film and ocular surface the fifth part is differentiating it from evaporative or aqueous deficient and the sixth part finally is the management part so i'll dissect each one of this part individually for you to make it more simpler so just to repeat it for the sake of all the audience so the six tasks that we are going to do in this exercise are first triaging questions this will help us to confirm that you are looking at dry eye symptoms and not any other eye condition that mimics a dry eye second after you confirm that the symptoms are because of dry eye you go ahead and see what are the risk factors involved in it and know whether they are modifiable or non modifiable then the third one is the screening questionnaire here you try to question the patient for the symptoms they are facing 
depending upon the score in the symptoms, you know the severity of symptoms that the patients are facing. Sorry. Fourth one, we try to do tests like the tear breakup time that can be invasive or non-invasive, osmolarity, and surface staining. The best part of this test is you need not do all the tests. The simple thing that all of us have access to is staining. So even if you don't have an access to non-invasive tear breakup time or a osmolarity, nothing to worry. You can still go ahead and do a simple staining, ocular surface staining to get the tear film homeostasis marker and get this fourth step done. The fifth thing is again subtype of classification where you want to know whether this is because of aqueous deficit or evaporative thing, where we do some more tests. In these tests also, luckily you need not depend on high-end equipment. I'll explain that in detail in the coming slides. And the final step is once you know which kind of dry eye it is, you try to treat it accordingly. So task one. So these are several triaging questions that we have to ask. How severe is the eye discomfort? Is there an associated dryness of the mouth that indicates to Sjogren's? Uh, are the symptoms uh, continuous in nature or is it a triggering event? Was there a trauma? Is the patient a contact lens user? Is the vision affected and does it clear with blinking more towards computer usage syndrome? Are the symptoms uh, worse in one eye than the other? Because usually dry eye is symmetrical or more or less bilateral. So when you see something in one eye, it's highly, more likely that you're looking at a different condition than dry eye. And the same time, do the eyes itch? Are there any swollen, crusty or any other discharge? Are we looking at any lit problems that we have to face because of which this condition has happened? And finally, you also have to take into account the general health condition of the patient and know that are there any other collagen vascular diseases, rheumatoid factors and all these things, recent uh, transplants or all these things when you take into consideration, you just finish the first step. The second step, as I have told you, we divide it into two, the modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. So if you see non-modifiable aging, as you grow in age, the prevalence of dry eye increases and it is more in female sex when compared to male and Asians are more prone to dry eye. And in the same way, meibomian gland dysfunction is also Interestingly, it is not a modifier, though we have many treatments for it, it is still comes under the non-modifiable part. Next, the systemic conditions like connective tissue disease, graft versus host disease, Sjogren's syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, all these things are non-modifiable. You only treat it symptomatically and try to give relief to the patient, but these are the things that you cannot modify. Luckily, we have some modifiable things uh, in the risk factors that can be taken care of, like suppose the patient is having problem with the hormones like androgen deficiency where you can do a estrogen replacement, uh, contact lens where you can switch from contact lens to glasses, smoking can be stopped, pollution also you can uh, take sufficient care, low humidity places, it's a typical uh, sick, syndrome, sick building syndrome, that's all our uh, software companies where the air is being recirculated in the same building again and again, there is increase in dryness, there is less humidity, this causes uh, dry eye. And in the same way, a lot of the drugs that we use both uh, systemically or uh, topically, most of the anti-glaucoma medications, uh, topical anesthetics or preservatives that are there in the drops. And systemically, you can see most of the antipsychotic drugs, anxiolytics, antihistaminics, all these things lead to dry eye. And also finally, hydrogenically, it can be caused by surgery that we do. That can be a refractive surgery or a cataract surgery or any ocular surface surgery that you're going to do that will disturb the ocular homeostasis to some extent leading to dry eye and it will slowly heal over time with uh, assistive treatment. So that is the, we have completed task two. Let us go to task three. So task three is again simple. You don't invest anything in this. These questionnaires are readily available in the net. So the simple questionnaire we follow at our Institute Sri Kiran is the DEQ. So in this question, these are questions about discomfort. If the score is above five or six, we uh, confirm that as the patient is having symptomatic dry eye. If you want to have a more comprehensive questionnaire, the OSDI questionnaire is better. OSDA questionnaire, we only tend to use it when we do research work and we are planning for publication. Even if you don't have time for any of this questionnaire, it's not a problem. 
If the patient is symptomatic, most of the times the non-specific complaints the patient tells, if you go back to the slit lamp, examine properly again, 80% of the time, the cause will be dry eye. So that is the reason when the patient is symptomatic, just don't brush it away. Please go back and see and try to look at the lids, the ocular surface, tear film debris, everything in a proper way so that you give importance to his symptoms and then treat the patient accordingly. Task four, as I have told you, this is the important test or the basic test we have to perform to confirm whether there is a break in the tear film homeostasis. As you have seen here, the first box is the non-invasive tear breakup time, which is the preferred one, because all the recent studies tell that fluorescein is not as reliable as the non-invasive tear breakup time. And in the same way, in again non-invasive, automated non-invasive TBUT has a superior discriminative ability in detecting dry eye, according to a study by Muji et al. in JAMA Ophthalmology. So if you see here, it is not a compulsion that you do all the three tests. In this slide, I am confining myself only to the tear breakup time. So if at all you have to do a fluorescein thing, please do the fluorescein test in the last. This is the order in which you have to do the test. If you don't have non-invasive tear bud, forget about it. If you don't have access to osmolarity, forget about it. The next thing you have to do is do the conjunctival staining. Once you finish the conjunctival staining, look at the cornea, conjunctiva and lid margin. And then finally look at the invasive T but with fluorescein. So if you do this single test, that is good enough for you to know whether the patient has a break in the homeostasis. Now let us look at the uh, automated non-invasive tear bud that we do with the Scheinflug imaging we have in our institute. This is the serious machine, which automatically takes the reading. If you see here, these are all the orange or yellow spots are the dry spots that are happening. So I'll just play it again for you. So if you see here, when the tear film after the lid is closed, it is green. And once these spots occur, you can see that spots occurring in the area. And here in the picture down, you know exactly in which time those spots have occurred. So the first spot has occurred in the periphery at 2.9 seconds, followed by 3.4, 4, 6.3, and so on. So this is again a test that is homeostasis marker. I don't think most of you will have access to it because it's very expensive. The machine is not only expensive, but the consumables that we use in are also expensive in this. So it's a point of care test. So what happens it here, it takes 50 nanoliters of tear from the lower meniscus. And uh, we use a single use test card. The technology is called as lab on chip technology. That is the reason it is so expensive. And it measures the impedance of the tear films and it gives you a value. So if the osmolarity value is anywhere more than 308, you have to consider it as a dry eye. Or if the, or if the inter eye difference is more than eight, then you also you have to consider it as a dry eye. Now this is the most practical thing that all of us can do. So by just a simple conjunctival stay, uh, corneal staining with fluorescein and uh, seating under a slit lamp with cobalt flu, built up right, you can see these beautiful spots that are seen in the cornea. So any surface that is healthy will not take up stain. That is a simple thing. So when the cornea is ha has a problem, so when you see more than five corneal spots because of fluorescein or in with lysamine green, when you stain the conjunctiva and lid margins, when you see more than nine conjunctival spots, and in the lid margin, when the lengthwise more than two millimeters is involved and widthwise 25% is involved, these are all signs of dry eye. So just give importance to these three things, fluorescein and lysamine green staining in your clinic. So more than five corneal spots of fluorescein, conjunctival spots with lysamine that are more than nine, and in the lid margin that is more than two mm in length and 25% in width. So the next is going to subclassify whether it is an aqueous deficient or evaporative dry eye. So first we'll finish off with the aqueous deficit, which is not much common. So here 
uh, what you have to do is you have to look at the tear meniscus height because that is where you know the tear volume. So if you see the tear meniscus height, you can do it in a regular slit lamp that has a good graticule or you can either do it in an OCT or in most of the tear film devices where we are able to see the tear meniscus height. So it is the height of the tear meniscus from the lower lid. So if the tear meniscus height is around 0.2 millimeters, that is more than 200 microns, it is less mild. And as it comes down and becomes less than 0.1 or less than 100 microns, the more severe this disease becomes. These are the cases in which we have to retain the uh, liquid that is already there in the eye by placing some plugs or doing a punctal cautery. Now let us go to the more common kind of uh, subtype that is the evaporative dry eye. And let us go into detail the mebomian gland examination, mebography, blink mechanism, and the lipid layer that is involved here. So if you see here, mebomian gland dysfunction is again defined by the International Workshop of MGD as a chronic diffuse abnormality of the mebomian glands characterized by two things. One, there is a terminal duct obstruction and or qualitative and quantitative changes in the tears that are being secreted. It can be either of these two or both of them. So the mebomian gland disease, if you see in this vicious circle that happened here, it can be inflammation or blockage in the gland leading to a proliferation of bacteria that release lipases and esterases, increasing the melting temperature of the mebum, leading to dry eye. So if you see the upper lid here, has 25 to 40 mebonian glands that you can appreciate nicely. And the length is around 5.5 millimeters. Whereas in the lower lid, the glands are comparatively less, they're 20 to 30. And the length is also less, that is only 2 mm. So this each gland, again, if you see carefully, they have this dot-like things called as the secretory acini, which secrete the mebum that form the lipid layer of the tears. So this is how the normal upper lid and lower lid looks, the MGD, uh, sorry, the mebomian glands. And here you can clearly see the mebomian gland drop out in both upper lid and lower lid. So before we go into mebomography, again here, a simple LLPP testing to look at the lids and mebomian glands can be done in a slit lamp. So look at the base of the lashes, lid position, where the opposition is good or not. How is the blink? Look at the tear meniscus, conjunctiva and cornea. Look for any inflammatory signs. Next, lift the upper lid. Look for superior corneal lesions, any conjunctival anomalies like papillae or foreign bodies, and rule out superior lambic keratitis. Pull the upper lid again to look for laxity and floppiness. And finally, push the lower lid to express the mebum, see for the mebum, what is the quality and quantity that you're expressing out of it. So LLPP again is a very classical clinical examination that all of us can do without any fancy equipment in our routine OPDs. So LLPP should be performed for all the cases where you are suspecting MGD disease and dry eye. So now let us go into mebography. So when I tell mebography, most of you may be thinking that it's an advanced thing where you need to invest again in a new equipment. But you'll be surprised to know that most of your existing equipment will be helpful for you to highlight this mebomian glands. If at all you're not having that also, you can do a simple do-it-yourself thing that I'll share it. Next, I'll touch upon the dedicated advanced things. And also for academic interest, I'll touch upon the confocal microscope. So if you see here, with regular white light illumination, you only see the blood vessels that are here. So once that is illuminated with infrared, this is how beautifully you can see the mebomian glands with the SNA. So this, this is already this kind of infrared illumination would be there in most of the autorefs. So if you see here, these are the pictures taken with autoref. Again, these are the pictures taken with the NCT. However, the central part is dark in NCT. 
in IOL master 500 again, you have access to it. You can see these things beautifully. Any fundus camera with infrared camera, again, you can see these things. And if you have access to specular microscopy also, you can highlight this thing. So if you have any of this equipment already in your clinic, try to avert the lids and just see it through the screen. Most of the times you will be, however, you will not be able to document it, but you will be able to appreciate any dropout straight away. Suppose you don't have access to any of this, even then it is fine. You can just buy an infrared light source that is hardly $100 online. The specification should be that it should be an 850 nanometer light source and the camera should not have an infrared filter. So most of the Samsung cameras or slit lamps with imaging systems will not have this IR filter. So once you shine this light, this is how you can get those images beautifully taken with a simple torchlight illumination and a camera with infrared uh, lighting without a filter. So coming to the standard mibographers, as I have told you, we are using this serious uh, mibography where we use the infrared illumination here to see the thing. But there is something called more advanced, like the Lippi scan, where it highlights and crosses even trans illumination to have a better look at the SNI also as an individual unit. So next, the next model is auto detection and 3D modeling that is available from SBM Hydra, where you can see this image that it has actually 3D modeled the entire meibomian glands that are there in this area. It auto detects them and then creates a 3D model for you to know exactly where the uh, cell uh, loss is there. And whatever mebographer you use, you can use this mebo scale to see the degree of loss depending upon the area of dropout, it becomes degree zero to degree four, starting from zero, 25, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, and more than 75. And it is different both for lower lid and upper lid, as we have seen that both of them have different glands and different lengths. So this is just for academic purpose. So if you want to go ahead and histologically classify the type of dry eye, so this is how a normal, uh, Mibomian glands look like the lumens are very clear and the walls are nice. So grade one lumen obstruction with minimal inflammation is seen. You can see the loss of that oval shape here and some inflammatory cells. In the grade two, there is intraepithelial inflammation and there is loss of the complete lumen. Finally, there is fibrosis and epithelial destruction. So these are the in vivo confocal microscopy images of the lids. So next, coming to the important part, the lipid layer thickness or non-invasive tuber. Non-invasive tuber we have already covered previously. So this is more regarding the lipid layer thickness. So there is an equipment called as Lippy View again, which uh, sees this lipid layer thickness specifically. And uh, anything that is above 100 nanometers is considered to be normal. So it, it gives a report like this where you can see the average LLT is below 100 and there is also a dropout. So you can correlate both LLT and MGD and you can come to a comprehensive uh, conclusion with help of this uh, equipment. So here, if you see this uh, eyelids here, these are the areas in which the blink has occurred. And when the blink has occurred, still after a blink, the lipid layer thickness did not go up to 100, which is normal. It still continued to be below 50, which is way far below normal. So you can also correlate between the blink and the lipid layer thickness here in this picture. So the final task here is to treat these diseases depending whether it is aqueous deficient or evaporative diseases. So the first line of treatment is education, environmental modification, lubricants, lid hygiene, and warm compresses. The second line is preservative-free lubricants, temperature-controlled uh, massage, punctal occlusion, lippy flow, or intense pulse light, which I'll show you a few videos. And then you can add pulsed steroids, doxycycline, and cyclosporin or punctal flex in this stage. And finally, then you can add autologous serum eye drops, bandage contact lens, oral secretogogs, or uh, now we also have uh, mucin secretogogues like the 
ribamide from uh, ribasir and finally we can go for longer steroid use amniotic membrane graft tarsorophy and a per permanent punctal occlusion or a minor salivary gland uh, transplantation that is rarely required so this is a stepwise fashion that we take in this so coming broadly in the medical management of meibomian gland disease uh, antibiotics play a very important role because uh, these antibiotics especially doxycycline is known for its anti mmp activity so we usually in mgd we give 100 mg bd for 2 to 3 weeks if the mgd is really bad there is no harm in prolonging this treatment for 1 to 2 months along with this we also give azithromycin 1% ointment in night time for 2 weeks and if there is inflammation still that is persisting you can add azithromycin dexamethasone eye drops that are available bd or tid for 2 weeks depending upon the severity so it is about the systemic and topical antibiotics that are preferred for mgd when it comes to anti inflammatory we should always prefer steroid sparing drugs like cyclosporin or tacrolimus rarely when they are not controlled with this drugs you can use dexamethasone prednisolone or lotiprednol uh, closely monitoring the iop and titrating the drugs according to it in the western countries they also use lifetigrast and interleukins that are not available in our country essential fatty acids is a controversial topic the dream study tells that it doesn't have a role but uh, if you see the recent ascrs cornea clinical committee 80% of this committee have recommended their role as an adjunctive therapy omega 3 fatty acids there's no harm in using so i prefer i still prefer to use them for most of my patients especially if they are undergoing a refractive procedure cataract or a refractive surgery we can use them for 3 to 6 months and if the patient has an associated blepharitis or dermatitis dem we have to give them lit scrubs and tea tree oil if you see this is a simple uh, after uh, asking the patient to do heat compressions for a few weeks you can manually express the mebum with help of this mebum expressors that are easily available in most of the companies you just go sectionally one by one and sequentially you can beautifully open up those meibomian glands you can apply some topical anesthesia so that the patient will not feel the pain you can do it as an opd procedure you can do two lips at a time give a break and do the second lip again and this is the lippy flow so in this i think uh, the device is not shown here but the advantage with this thing is Uh, the device gives pulsations from the inner part of the lid it actually gives pulsations like this and clears the blocks that are there in the asne and glands and lets out the mebum so if you see that pulsations along with heat work in a very nice way and uh, that will help to clog out all the material that is there If you carefully see here, that is the applicator. It goes and sits on this clear eye. It doesn't touch the cornea. It goes and sits on this clear eye, and its posterior surface is uh, just on the inner side of the lower and uh, upper lid. That starts to give a pulsation. Finally, this is again a very simple uh, technique. That is Ilux. So it captures the eye lid. both from inside and outside and it raises its temperature till 42 degrees and keeps it till 40 seconds or 50 seconds and after that you manually press the button to express out the mebum this is a very handy device and it's not very expensive but still not available in india but widely used in western countries and finally we have a limited experience with this intense pulse light that in which uh, intense regulated pulse lights are given uh, in the lower lid and uh, left lateral canthal area which uh, stimulates the parasympathetic nerves leading to opening of the clogged fluids so this all these things they don't work in isolation sometimes you need to combine each of these things and see which works best for the patient along with your regular medication you have to be more aggressive if the patient is going for a refractive surgery all said and done in a lighter vein what we have learned from this mgd therapy is in a way mgd is like your spouse you presume to control it 
but in reality the control is only transient as all of you remember in the initial slides i have told you mgd is still a non non modifiable risk factor whatever you are going to do is going to be there only for 6 months or 1 year you need to repeat these treatments and uh, then plan the next treatments accordingly so now let us go to the post test answers that we have finished our uh, session now so we'll go back to the five questions that i have asked you in the starting of this session which one of the following is included in the definition of tri eye multifactorial disease ocular symptoms hyperosmolarity all of the above thank you that's a 94% correct answer i'm so happy for that thank you so all of the above is the right answer which one of the following does not cause evaporative dry eye mgd lacrimal gland dysfunction improper blinking contact lens intolerance thank you that's a decent enough lacrimal gland dysfunction is the right answer and 70% of you have answered it right next ocular surface staining can be assessed by corneal staining lid margin staining conjunctival staining all of the above i expect a very good answer for this i think we have spent sufficient time on this slide excellent that's a 95% correct answer so all of the above is the answer so next which is not a modifiable risk factor in dry eye contact lens wear mgd computer usage medications thank you again it's an 80% correct answer as i have told you meibomian gland disease is not a modifiable risk factor the final question identify the diagnostic test in the picture mmp9 detecting device tlab osmolarity testing lipid layer thickness both a and c so osmolarity is the correct answer right so we finish this uh, post test now so thank you all for your uh, kind attention i think uh, very rarely in life uh, you see people who believe in this philosophy that we are here to add what we can to life and not to get what we can from it and i'm so fortunate that i have been able to meet three people who believe in this thing and have taught me all that i have learned here one is my teacher dr venkatesh prajna sir from arvind eye hospital madurai one is our chairman dr s chandrashekar from srikaran institute of ophthalmology kakinada and my father dr u v raman raj garu from bemoharam and i thank my family and uh, cornea team especially my fellows for helping me to put this uh, presentation for you now without much delay let us first answer the questions that are raised by the delegates who have uh, registered so they have asked me to elaborate about punctal plugs and cautery so if you see punctal plugs and cautery we use it in moderate dry eye conditions and there are presently three options that are available for you one is the collagen plugs that are short term and dissolvable it can be used like a therapeutic trial but the problem with this plugs is once they start to dissolve they go into the canaliculi and it is difficult for you to remove if there is any inflammatory or inf infectious condition that is involved the most common plugs that we use in practice are the silicon plugs because they are permanent plugs they come in multiple sizes you have better sizing options and there is also a probe that comes with this injection and injector and the advantage is it also has closed and open head if you see here it is an open head because sometimes we need to use drugs like uh, cyclosporin or reba rebamamide or steroids so these drugs uh, they may not stay in the eye for longer time but at the same time when it is there they get drained off easily and you can still use lubricants when you use this open ended open headed silicon plugs intracanalicular plugs are very rarely used in uh, are part because actually they are longer lasting but they are more associated with the complications and the advantage with them is there is lesser foreign body sensation uh, if you don't have access to any of these plugs not an issue at all you have an access to cautery 
a simple punctal cautery will do the job. So when you uh, cauterize the lower punctum properly, a lot of uh, tear film can be retained. And uh, the advantage with this is when you do it under a microscope, you are 100% sure of the closure. And uh, thus you can give good results to the patient even if you don't have access to punctal plugs. Next, somebody asked me about the, the uh, association between dry eye and vitamin D deficiency. So I think it's a very recent study published by Watts et al. in IJO. So if you see vitamin D deficiency in India is somewhere between 40 to 80%. And vitamin D deficiency is also associated with diabetes, CVD, and atopia, again, which is a risk factor for dry eye. So, and vitamin D deficiency has a very important role in estrogen biosynthesis and signaling. And especially in postmenopausal women where this estrogen comes down, the dry eye becomes more evident. This can be attributed to it. So, I just trying to find out from my endocrinologist friends, they told that we can give vitamin D supplementation orally like vitamin D3, 1000 IU capsules once daily for a month or two months and injection single dose of IM 50,000 as an injection. Uh, but you have to monitor the blood levels of D3 and D2 and then titrate the medications accordingly. So there is definitely a relation between uh, uh, vitamin D and I that is now recently coming up, but it's still in an evolving stage. Next is the question about diabetes. Diabetes, again, 15 to 30% of the diabetes have dry eye. After diabetic retinopathy in diabetics, the most common eye condition is dry eye, which most of us under treat. And especially this increases to 50% with age. So any individual with 65 years of age is 50% chance. Every one person in two elderly diabetic patients is more likely to suffer from dry eye. And it has a very positive correlation with glycosylated hemoglobin and we should treat these conditions judiciously. So this is a simple uh, multifactorial way in which diabetes can cause dry eye by decreasing the density of uh, nerve fibers, impairment of epithelium, epithelial wound healing, increased osmolarity, uh, development or promotion of inflammation and dysfunction of tear film. So this leads to structural and microenvironmental changes disturbing the ocular surface. And effects of hyperglycemia can directly affect the lacrimal gland leading to dysfunction. And from that effects from the aqueous deficient side, and this is from the evaporative side. Finally, this is one more question most of the participants have asked me to tell about pediatric dye eye disease uh, that we try to underestimate in today's world. It has become very prominent so uh, after this COVID situation because most of our children are attending these classes on online platforms. So several studies even before this pandemic showed that dry eye disease was there in 7 to 25 percent of the cases. The causes are similar to adults like congenital anomalies, autoimmune diseases, allergy, increased screen time that is there in today's scenario, hydrogenic causes, and vitamin A deficiency. So how do we prevent this dry eye was one of the questions I was asked. The main thing for prevention is patient education and telling the patient that this problem is chronic. So first he has to do certain environmental modifications to prevent dryness, to avoid direct blower that is going into his eye, manage his screen time in a sufficient way to avoid overexposure to digital screens and use artificial tears and omega-3 fatty acid supplements in a proper way. And apart from that, keep a good lid hygiene and make sure that the lids and ocular surface are always healthy. The next question is dry eye in Sjogren's syndrome. This is again an aqueous deficient kind of dry eye in which uh, omega-3 fatty acids have to be, uh, have been, have to have a very beneficial effect. The differentiating factor here is the patient also has a dry mouth where the entire exocrine gland dysfunction is seen. Here, corticosteroids, we can be used both orally and topically. Special RGP lenses can be used. Cyclosporin, autologous serum, punctal plugs with cautery, Filament debridement with anestyle cysteine uh, drops can be used, environmental modification, and the same management as we do in rheumatoid arthritis or collagen vascular disease. One more question I was asked was graft versus host disease. So ocular GVHD affects the ocular surface and mucins. So it typically follows an allogenic hemopoietic stem cell transplant, and it usually happens between one month to one year postoperatively. 
what happens is the donor immune system from the stem cell attacks the healthy recipient cells. So if you see here, that is why there is vascularization that comes into the cornea and this lipid deposits that you can see on the cornea. So here there is a promising role of mucin ceratogogues like rabapamide 2% that can be used two times continuously along with all the armatarium of drugs we have and all the treatment protocols you can follow similarly. One more interesting question I had was the association between dry eye and refractive errors. There is a negative correlation with hyperopia and a positive correlation with myopia. Non-invasive tear but correlates, the tear meniscus height does not correlate. This is what we got to study again from IJO, Yalda Vesh et al. Dry eye and keratoconus. This is one more important question where we see there is a decreased mucin production and greater tear instability sequentially because of it. And the contact lens where in uh, keratoconus also can aggravate dry eye. So in these cases, scleral contact lens can give better vision and wetting of ocular surface. There are several drugs. They have asked me the relation between drugs and dry eye. All your glaucoma drugs can cause dry eye. You know, all your anti-allergics can cause dry eye. Decongestants like nafazolin can cause dry eye. Antivirals can cause dry eye. Preservatives like BKC can cause dry eye. Your dilating drops and anesthetic drops also when abused can cause dry eye. When coming to systemic drugs, mostly antipsychotic drugs and antihistaminics are the most common, followed by sedatives and drugs that are secreted in tears like clofazimine and uh, chlorhydro uh, hydroxychloroquine. So the next important question I was asked was dry eye and cataract surgery. I think this is very relevant in today's scenario where our patients are demanding for a refractive outcomes and cataract surgery. So it's very important that when you the patient comes for a preoperative visits, it's better to have a contact lens holiday or no drops within two hours prior to examination. So all the non-invasive non refractive prior measurements like keratometry, topography, biometry, and debrometry have to be done after you don't use drops for two hours. That is the protocol given by ACRS. So next you go to the OSD screening. You can use the uh, questionnaires I have given, or I'll show you a separate ASCSR questionnaire that is there for it. And signs, again, you can see through osmolarity or conjunctival staining. Negative screen, OSD unlikely, you just do LLPP and go ahead with surgery. If it is positive, go again for optional non-invasive test like mebography, non-invasive tear bud time. And then this is the first part of the questionnaire. Again, this is mostly about symptoms. The second part is uh, uh, more about the lid conditions and the uh, symptoms that the patient are having during day and night. So depending upon the score, if the scoring is around 28, the more number of uh, red boxes the patient ticks, uh, we have to be careful. And the last line is most important thing. If the patient is whether it's easy going or perfection, anything beyond this line, just forget about refractive uh, cataract surgery. Just offer him a simple monofocal surgery here. So the next question was about which artificial tears and when. Practically speaking, all of them work very well. Uh, it's an individual choice that you can make. But uh, commonly, we try to start off with uh, CMC or HPMC. And then if the patient is uh, not happy with it, we go to liquid polyols like uh, PVA, PEG, and P glycerine and all this combination. There are a lot of choices that are available. But you have to remember that the uh, value or the action of this is very limited and transient. So I prefer to give uh, any CMC in the daytime. And nighttime, I try to give a preservative-free eye ointment. Always try to go in for a preservative-free trunk because BAK themselves again can trigger a dry eye situation. So dry eye and refractive surgery was one more question that was asked. So in dry eye and refractive surgery, these are the five steps you have to follow. Because in refractive surgery, again, if you don't treat the patient preoperatively, it can affect the topography and it can affect your refractive outcomes. So PRK has lesser dry eye when compared to femto and femto has lesser dry eye when compared to LASIK. LASIK has the highest number of dry eye according to a lot of studies. And the first point is uh, look for dry eye preoperatively. Don't miss dry eye. Treat it and only then proceed for surgery. Educate the patient that the dry eye symptoms may aggravate post-surgery and he need to use drops for a certain amount of time, like six months or one year also in certain cases. Increase the aggressiveness of treatment with all the armatarium we are having now 
depending upon the symptoms of the patient. It's simple, but as the patient's refractive outcomes are involved here, we just have to be more aggressive in both diagnosis and treatment. And the final question, which was very interesting, was dry eye and allergy, how do we differentiate? Actually, we can't differentiate it per se because it's a broad overlap of interaction. There is because you can't really differentiate, but I'll just highlight some points. Like in dry eye, the tear breakup time is shorter, whereas in allergic conjunctivitis is less likely to be affected. The conjunctival morphology again in dry eye will be normal, but when you lift the upper lid here, you can see papillae. Again, ocular symptoms, is dry eye improves with blinking as here it uh, worsens if the papillae is there. Uh, it, uh, the dry eye is worse in the evening. As the day progresses, the dryness increases. Whereas in allergy, uh, morning time, it's uh, worser when compared to evening. And if you go into tests, uh, the prick test for allergens will be positive in allergic conjunctivitis and histamine levels will be more than 50, which is pathognomic of allergic conjunctivitis. Now I'll take the questions that are there in the Q&A sections. I think we still have some time. Five minutes or so. May I have your opinion about warm compresses and eyelid scrub? What is your technique and uh, do the scrub? So this is a simple thing. Uh, I think it's best to ask them to combine it with their bathing routine. So uh, strokes both from the upper lid and lower lid 10 times after warm compresses. And uh, then they can do the lid scrubs with a baby shampoo. So if you ask them to do without the bathing routine, they may try to skip it. So you can ask them to do it twice a day, morning and evening. So that makes it more practical. So dry eye in children, I think I've already covered that slide. Uh, testing changing. Yes, uh, the testing changes when the child is, we go only for non-invasive tests first and then rarely use the invasive tests. Play important role in dryness. Yes, as I've told you, scleral contact lens has a very good role in this thing. Uh, Harika, our old student, has asked, uh, what is the name of the instrument used to, that is called as the ILUX. It is available from uh, Novartis or Alcon. Uh, what is the antibiotic? And when to go for lippy flow? Uh, all these, I have told you, lippy flow and IPL treatments, we usually go for them uh, before the patient is opting for a refractive outcome, especially a uh, surgery, cataract surgery, or multifocal surgery, or uh, refractive uh, LASIK. Uh, we want to make sure that the ocular surface is healthy prior and post to have a good refractive outcome. That is where we treat it aggressively. If the patient is not having uh, uh, much symptoms, uh, that is when we don't go for these uh, procedures. Eyeless massage does help in dry eye. Right time to start topical cyclosporine. Topical cyclosporine, you can start right from the moderate dry eye, when the symptoms are there in the moderate condition itself, we prefer to use cyclosporine before steroids because it's a steroid sparing drugs and you can avoid all the complications because of steroids. What if the patients are intolerant to doxycycline? Uh, that's a good question. I don't have an answer, but you can still try the topical medication like azithromycin that I have told you. Azithromycin and uh, dexamethasone combination also works well. Probably you can also try roxithromycin if it's not uh, with doxy. Yeah, uh, there is again a question that foreign body sensation after cataract surgery. Yeah, this is again because all these patients, as I've told you, elderly diabetic patients, especially if they're undergoing cataract surgery, the symptoms are not uh, over. They'll be subclinical. But your surgery will uh, break this homeostasis and they'll become clinical and they'll start to attribute the foreign body sensation to your surgery. That is the reason that you have to do a very meticulous ocular surface examination before you go ahead. I think again, my very close friend, Dr. Sujit Biswas from Bangladesh has raised a very good question. Do you think dry eye evolving as a public health problem? I do agree with you. Dry eye is slowly becoming a pandemic after COVID. And as ophthalmologists, it's our duty to educate the public, especially younger children, now who are more becoming addicted to uh, digital screens. And I think dry eye cases are going to increase. And I told you in the start, dry eye by itself is going to become a subspecialty in ophthalmology. In a low care, what should be an entry point of care for dry eye? 
I think the simple lip scrubs that we have discussed should do lip massages and artificial triers. Filamentary keratopathy is very easy to treat. Filamentary keratopathy, you just moisten the bud with a topical anesthetic and you debride the buds in under slit lamp and place a BCL and put the patient on N-acetylcysteine. N-acetylcysteine is not available as drops form. So they are available as injections that they use for uh, patients with uh, respiratory problems. These uh, things you can just double dilute it so that you can get uh, N-acetylcysteine in drops form, store them in the fridge and use it three to four times a day. So what is the rate of punctum opening of the thalmac? That's a very good question. I think 20% uh, of them try to open partially, 10% of them open back again normally. But again, if you do it meticulously under a microscope, this reopening becomes less problematic. Castor oil treatment for dry eye, uh, I don't have with an exp uh, personal experience with it, sir, but uh, I have to check for the literature to see it. Yes, uh, cyclosporin can be used as a first line therapy in moderate dry eye, not for mild diseases. You just keep it for moderate dry eye diseases. Yes. Viral conjunctivitis leads to, yes, viral conjunctivitis leads to decrease uh, uh, this thing and any correlation with COVID. Yeah, I think now that is a hot topic now, but we are yet to analyze the data that's going to come out. What is your protocol for omega-3 prescriptions? All in moderate dry eyes or post-refractive uh, uh, surgery, we give omega-3 fatty acids from one month to three months. Yeah. MG probing. I don't believe in probing, but expression that I have showed you, that is a better way to do it. Because probing, I don't think you can practically do each and every gland. So instead of that, you ask the patient to use hot compresses in the home for one or two weeks. And then with help of this Mebum expressors, you can easily uh, remove all the things that you have here. Yeah. I think uh, yeah, I have answered most of the questions. We just have one more minute. And I would like to thank Lawrence once again for uh, uh, being in the background and supporting me to give this wonderful lecture today. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you once again.